Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Scale Modeling with Mike Ashey. This evening, we're going to do part two of aircraft assembly techniques and tips. So, let's get started. Clear plastic can be somewhat brittle, so it's best to cut them off their trees, leaving a small amount of the stub on the part. Once all the clear parts are cut off their trees, carefully snip off the remaining stubs. Here's an example of using snippers to cut off a tree stub. The positioning of the snipper is important, as it should be set along the narrow side of the stub to reduce the chance of cracking the part. I like to trim excess plastic by slicing it off with a sharp number 11 X-Acto blade elevated on a wood block. And sometimes you can peel away the excess plastic layers a little at a time. When tree connection points are along canopy framing, use a sanding stick to smooth out the plastic and use masking tape to protect the clear sections. Sometimes clear parts are too short and need a little extra plastic like those on these P38 side windows. Super glue can be used so long as the vapors don't get trapped under the part, which can fog clear plastic. Here's another example of adding extra plastic to a clear part. Here again, super glue was used and the clear plastic areas were protected from glue vapors with masking tape. To glue parts together, I prefer to tape them tightly with masking tape first. This allows me to properly position the parts together and I use as much masking tape as needed to secure the halves tightly together. Here's another example of parts which are now ready for gluing. I like to use medium viscosity super glue applied with a thin stiff wire applicator along the seam lines between the masking tape locations. The capillary action of the super glue will pull the glue down between the parts gluing surfaces. I make a puddle of super glue on a piece of paper, dip the tip of the wire into the puddle and then apply it along the seam line. I also keep the glue about an eighth of an inch away from the edges of the masking tape. Once the glue is dry, you can remove the masking tape and apply super glue to these locations. As you apply the glue, you will see it gets sucked down in between the seam line. Several applications may be necessary to get the super glue flush with the surface of the assembled part. Always use fresh super glue for gluing. Once the glue loses its viscosity, wipe it off the paper and apply a fresh puddle. Here's an example of having to apply several layers of super glue to this fuselage assembly to fill the seams and all the tiny voids along the seam line. When applying super glue along a seam line, be sure to be diligent about using tiny amounts of glue at areas where there are raised or indented details so you don't ruin them. To fill voids between parts, I like to use strips of plastic of various thicknesses. I then apply tiny beads of super glue around the strips and here again the capillary action of the glue pulls it inside the gluing surface areas. To fill the voids around the cowling to fuselage attachment on this assembly, I used a combination of super glue and strips of plastic. The cowling to wing attachment on this AMT 148 scale Marauder assembly required lots of different thicknesses of plastic strips to fill the voids. Using plastic strips to fill voids and attaching them with super glue creates very strong bonds between parts. Here's another example of using plastic strips and super glue to fill voids. Once the plastic is trimmed and sanded smooth, it will blend right into the surface. If you were to just use super glue to fill the voids here, the glue would eventually sag at the center area, marring your finished model. Even newer kits have void issues. This 132nd scale Dauntless is no exception. Using longer strips allows you to properly position them into place prior to gluing. And once the plastic is super glued around its entire perimeter, you can then trim them. 
You can also use small lengths of plastic strips to fill very tiny voids. And you can use very tiny strips to fill in the edges of part halves, which sometimes have rounded edges. On seam areas that are curved, a number 11 X-Acto blade works very well to carefully and surgically scrape down the superglue along a seam line. Sanding sticks, either wet or dry, work very well for smoothing plastic on curved surfaces. Some exterior surface parts, like this boom air intake on a P38, sat above the surface, so the excess plastic needed to be carefully scraped off to get the surfaces flush. After scraping the surfaces flat, they were sanded smooth with various grades of sandpaper and the plastic was then polished with 0000 steel wool. On semi-flat or flat surfaces, use various grades of sandpaper, wet or dry, wrapped around lengths of various thicknesses of balsa wood to lightly sand seam smooth. The wing to fuselage seams on this Dauntless were lightly wet sanded with various grades of sandpaper and balsa wood strips. To protect surface detail, cover them with masking tape. Another benefit of using sandpaper wrapped around balsa wood strips is that it helps to limit surface detail damage. After initial scraping and sanding of the seams, I always use Tester's enamel silver paint as a crack and flaw detector. I then apply additional coats of superglue to those areas that need it. Sometimes it takes several iterations of superglue and silver paint, and I always apply one final coat of the silver paint to be sure everything looks good. I like to use 0000 steel wool to polish the plastic and to remove silver paint. Steel wool pads are much better and they can be found on eBay. The steel wool also creates lots of very fine fibers so cover all the part openings with masking tape and do the polishing on paper towels so the fibers can easily be cleaned up. Some voids are in very hard to reach places that are difficult to fill, like the underside of this MiG-3. In these cases, first airbrush flat paint primer around the area of the void. Apply a bead of white glue to the void with a stiff wire applicator. If the void is long, do the white glue filling in stages so the glue surface will stay wet. And remember, white glue sticks very well to flat paint. While the white glue is still wet, use a dampened Q-tip to contour the glue and remove any excess. And apply additional coats as necessary after each layer dries. Reprime the surface and check for flaws. Apply more white glue, contour it, and then reprime it again. You can also use white glue to fill some types of open areas. The elevator fuselage connection on this 148 scale AMT Marauder is a good example. The left side has been filled, contoured, and primed, and now I'm working on the right side. To rescribe panel lines, use labeling tape, which is very flexible and it has a really nice edge. To start the process, I always redraw the lines that need to be repaired with a pencil. Around curved surfaces, reducing the width of the labeling tape helps it contour around these types of surfaces when scribing. And labeling tape works great for scribing straight lines because it has such a nice edge. Here's an example of using several strips of labeling tape to repair the engraved panel lines on this Dauntless STB. As I said previously, to facilitate scribing, always set the locations with a pencil line. This allows you to check the individual lines positioning along the surface and that the lines are also parallel with each other. I also use pencil lines to restore indented rivet detail. Here I am using a punch to slightly indent each rivet location. 
To duplicate the depth and diameter of the indented rivets, I used a very tiny diameter drill bit. The indentation set by the punch positioned the tip of the drill bit at each rivet location. Here's another example of using a punch to restore indented rivet detail. In this case, the rivet detail was shallow, so I pressed the punch a bit deeper into the plastic to duplicate the rivets. To smooth out the raised plastic around each indentation made by the tip of the punch, use 0000 steel wool pads to smooth out the surface. Here's my completed Trumpeter 132nd scale P38, which had more than a few fit and void issues. All the techniques and tips I have presented in these two tutorials were used to build this kit. Here's a close-up of the P38, and you cannot detect any surface issues where the voids were. Here's my Dauntless STB in pre-war colors. And here's my AMT 148 scale Marauder, which also had a lot of fit issues, especially at the wing to fuselage and cowling to wing connection areas. And here's the House of Gallery P47, which had that lower step issue between the cowling and the fuselage. Using all the techniques and tips presented in these two tutorials, you can get great results even on ancient kits like this 148 scale 1960s issue by lifelike models of a Bristol box kite. The monogram 148 scale Marauder has a lot of fit and void issues, but if you use my systematic techniques, you can build this model up into a great looking replica. This is the Revell 132nd scale F4U Corsair, which I purchased for about $10 many years ago. It can be built up into a great looking model using my assembly techniques and tips. The Hasegawi 132nd scale Hellcat has some issues and areas where refinement is needed. However, this old kit can also be built up into a great looking model. Working with these older kits will really sharpen your scale modeling skills. And I just love the challenge of taking an old kit and improving it while demonstrating that just because it's an old kit doesn't mean it's outdated. And just one more. Here's the tape up of the Hasegawa 132nd scale P47 cockpit. The interior is well done, but it's going to require a lot of detailed painting to get everything to stand out. However, using the Edward pre painted Photo Edge cockpit detail set, and their pre-painted seat belts. Combined with careful airbrushing and some basic weathering, you can turn a good-looking cockpit into a masterpiece. These are the same scale modeling axioms I presented in part one. Again, I won't read them to you, but you should take them to heart. And remember, scale modeling is a three-dimensional assembly hobby that allows you to be as creative as you want to be. Remember to always have fun, explore new ways to do things, Experiment and share what you have learned, and above all, ignore the accuracy hounds and the perfectionists. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed part two of Assembly Techniques and Tips. And don't forget to visit us at www.mikeashy.com. Happy Scale Modeling, and have a great evening.